If you have your Bibles this morning, would you join me in the book of Acts? While you're turning, remember we have several people and uh, probably 80 plus people over in the other building uh, who are in our youth churches and people over there working with them and we sure want to remember them in uh, our prayers this morning. Acts chapter number 10. If you have your Bibles... It's page number 1163, if you have a Schofield Reference Bible. And I like to say this occasionally, if you can't find it, after about five minutes, just look up here intelligently and nobody will ever know the difference. <laughs> Book of Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he's Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. In him God, uh, him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him, after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and dead. To him gave all of the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Father, during these few moments that we have together, we consider them precious and we consider them important. We don't want to waste them. We want to invest them in our hearts and in our lives. And I pray for the next few minutes that you will help. And we welcome the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit of God into this auditorium to do in each and individual lives that which would be most pleasing to you. So bless us, help us around the Word of God, and I'll thank you and praise you for what you do for us, because we ask in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. I want to start off today by raising a question for each one of us. If somebody in the community where you live came to you and said, we are bringing together a group of people out of the community, everyone in the group is unsaved. There's a possibility that each of us will become a Christian and will trust Christ as our Savior based on 
your testimony and based on the message you share with us, what would you do? You would feel a tremendous load of responsibility if you was placed in a position where several people in a living room have assembled together and basically the bottom line, they're raising the question, who is Jesus? Is he important to you? What does he mean to you in your life? That is the situation in Acts chapter number 10. Cornelius, a Gentile, a lost Gentile, but a good man, has sent for Peter to come and to testify unto him how he might be saved. I want you to understand that Cornelius was a good man, but he was a lost man. I want you to notice in your Bibles, they define the traits of this man. In chapter number 10, verse number 2, the Bible said that he was a devout man. He was one that feared God with all of his house, which gave much alms to the people, and he prayed to God always. Now look at the traits and the characteristics in this man's life. Outstanding. He's a man of prayer. He's a man in verse number one who's in authority. He has about 600 soldiers under him. He says to this one, go, and he goes. He says to another one, come, and he comes. He's a very devout man. He's a very religious man, but he's a very lost man. And so he brings together a group of people. We are actually told in this chapter who he calls to his living room. In verse number 24, the Bible said that uh, he called together his kinsmen. I don't know how many of his family, but he brought some of his family together. He also called together his friends. I don't know how many friends he brought in. But they have a rather large group of people in a room somewhere, and they're going to ask Peter to come and answer some questions for them. Again, the questions being, who is Jesus? Is it possible to be saved? And what does it mean to be saved? So Peter comes and there's a long story to get him there, and I may have time to get into it, and I may not, but Peter comes, and he stands in the presence of Cornelius and his family and his friends. And he says some things to Cornelius and his family that I want to share with us today and hope that God will use it to speak to our hearts. Trying to win Cornelius to the Lord Peter breaks loose and he starts preaching. And the first point that he preaches to Cornelius, his family, and his friends is found in verse number 34. Peter opened his mouth and he said to Cornelius and his people, God is no respecter of persons. Now why would he say that? Let me share with you why he said that. In the book of Acts, we're in a transitional period. The Bible is very clear that Jesus Christ came from heaven down here to save sinners, but the Bible is also very clear that the people to whom Jesus Christ came to save, first of all, were the Jews. He did not come, first of all, for the Gentiles. That's us. The Jews produced the Lord Jesus, brought him into this world, and uh, he said he come for the Jewish people, uh, not for the Gentiles. He came to save that which was lost, and that which was lost was defined, first of all, as the Jewish people. In the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came, and the Bible said 3,000 people got saved, and they're still preaching to Jews. The first few chapters of the book of Acts is Jewish in nature. It's basically Jewish in nature until you get up in about the eighth chapter. And then... 
the tendency begins to move away from the Jew over to the Gentile. Uh, all of a sudden, we see Peter, who was an apostle to the Jews, being asked to go down to the house of Cornelius, who is a Gentile. Now, how did God bring that about? If you look in this chapter, it's very interesting. I don't have time. In verse number nine, Peter was hungry. And while he's waiting for the food to be prepared and placed on the table, he sees a vision and a large sheet is let down from heaven. And in that sheet, there are all kinds of animals. And the animals in that sheet are animals that are unclean animals for the Jewish people. God in the book of Leviticus, especially the 11th chapter of the book of Leviticus, had a very strict diet for the Jewish people. There happened to be meats that they could not eat, meats they could eat. He defines them. He describes them in the book of Leviticus. Uh, things like uh, uh, things, things like what we Baptists like, uh, bacon and, uh, and uh, sausage and, uh, and, and uh, ham and pork chops. I mean, I'm going to have to stop right here. Some of you are licking your chops right now. <laughs> And you're ready to go to lunch. But God said there are, certain, there are certain foods you stay away from. The Jewish people had a strict diet not to eat certain food. Now the Gentiles, they didn't care. They're like us. They just ate it all, just like we do. And when this sheet came down, God's teaching Peter a lesson. All of these animals in this sheet that he is seeing are animals that God said, you don't eat. Stay away from it. But there was a voice that came. God spoke to Peter and said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat these animals. Peter, being a good Jew, said, Not so, Lord. No, I'm not going to do that, Lord. You know, you know, the Bible says we've got a strict diet. We don't eat that kind of food. Listen to what God said. That which I have cleansed, call thou unclean. What was the Lord saying to Peter? No longer, no longer is this diet, no longer is this food, no longer is the law intact. We are now under grace. We're now going to reach out, not only to the Jew, but we're going to reach out to the Gentile world. And that's what's happening right here in the book of Acts. They are transitioning from the Jewish people. They're transitioning over to the Gentile so that whosoever can be saved, neither Jew nor Gentile, but everyone is now welcome into the family of God. And that's the reason Peter said, first of all, as he begins to preach to this room full of people, relatives and friends who want to know about Jesus, who want to know if he's the son of God, who want to know how to be saved, the first thing Peter wants to settle once and for all is, yes, you can be saved because God is no respecter of persons. Now, I'm glad of that. I'm thankful for that. We could say it this way. Uh, we're grateful that we're not living in an era when God would say, I'll save the people on a certain side of the tracks in the city if they meet the status quo, but I will not save those on the other side of the track. I'm glad the Bible is clear. God today saves people on both sides of the track. I'm glad that whosoever will can come and take of the water of life freely. Uh, that means the Jew can still be saved. Now, they're living in blindness. Romans 9, 10, and 11 talks about the Jew living in a state of blindness. The, wild, the natural olive branch has been cut off of the tree, and the wild olive branch, which is a Jewish nation, has been grafted in. And the Jew today is living in his land, and the Jew is living there lost and undone without a Savior. They do not accept the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, they're still looking for the, re for the coming of their Messiah. They will one day, they will acknowledge him. Uh, he'll come and uh, they'll see the scars in his hands, the Zechariah says, and they'll say, where did you get those wounds in your body? And he'll say, where I was wounded in the house of my friends. They will recognize him as the Messiah. They will turn and they will accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. But that's not so today. They look at Jesus as a false prophet. They look at Jesus as a false Messiah. And Peter was saying here to Cornelius, the Gentile, and to his family and his friends, God is no respecter of persons. Now, that means 
that if you're listening to me today and you're a Jew, you can be saved. That means if you're listening to me today and you're a Gentile, you can be saved. Do you say, you're saying, preacher, are you saying that, uh, that, that the Jew today has to be saved? by trusting Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, even though they do not believe in him. If the scales are pulled from their eyes and fall from their eyes and the Spirit of God is dealing with them, the Jew has to be saved the same way the Gentiles say. Uh, I'm saying this, my friend, if it's my family, God is no respecter of persons, uh, they have to be saved the same way. The Jew has to be saved the same way. There's a popular preacher on television today that says the Jew does not have to be saved the same way the Gentiles say. That's heresy. The Bible is clear. The Bible is trustworthy that salvation today in the world, any part of the world, wherever you go in the world, if anyone, if anyone is to be saved, they have to be saved through trusting Jesus Christ. That means all Baptists have to trust Jesus Christ to be saved. Uh, that means that uh, all Presbyterians have to trust Jesus Christ if they get saved. That means that all Methodists have to trust Jesus Christ if they get saved. That means that all Pentecostals have to trust Jesus Christ if they get saved. Uh, that means that all Masons have to trust Jesus Christ if they get saved. That means all fraternal organizations uh, have to trust Jesus Christ if they get saved. That means all of the Gadaloos clubs have to trust Jesus Christ if they get saved. That means means that all of the other organizations, secular and spiritual or whatever heading they come under, if they get saved, God only has one way of salvation. God is not a respecter of person. Notice what he said. His first message to Cornelius is, God is no respecter of persons. That means it's not a matter of race. It's not a matter of face. It's not a matter of place. It's a matter of grace. Thank God grace works. And we can be saved even if we're Gentile dogs, as we were called in the Word of God. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians that the middle wall of partition has been broken down between the Jew and the Gentile. It's there no longer. God's grace goes out to the ends of the world. John 3, 16, since Calvary has been in place for God so loved the world, W-O-R-L-D. That's not the world of trees and bushes and grass and fish and birds. That is the world of humanity. God so loved the world that whosoever, I'm so glad he said whosoever. If he said Ron Beatty, it scared me to death. Because I've gotten mail. I've actually received from some mail. I don't know how it got to me. But I found out there's another Ron Beatty, Mark, Matt, that lives in California. <laughs> and if I read that verse of scripture and it said, if Ron Beatty believed all of my life, I'd be wondering, am I the one that lives in California? he's talking about or the one that lives in North Carolina. But when he said whosoever the one in California can be saved the one in North Carolina can be saved and everybody else who comes under the umbrella of whosoever will can be saved. Listen, the only reason why a person wouldn't be saved today is if they have chosen not to be saved. It is not God's will that any should perish but that all A-L-L -L, all should come to repentance. That means if you're listening to me today in the building, out of the building, in an airplane, in an automobile, in a submarine it makes no difference who you are. It makes no difference where you are. It makes no difference what your name is. It makes no difference how much money or li how little money you have in your bank account, how many stocks and bonds you've got, what kind of retirement plan you've got, what your position is at the company, what kind of house you live in, what kind of clothes you wear, what kind of shoes you wear, what kind of automobile you drive, how many acres you've got tagged to your name. All of that don't mean one earthly thing. Uh, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Uh, and all all of the above and beyond that. If you want to be saved, uh, you can come to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. If you're young, you can be saved. God has no respecter of persons. Uh, if you're a teenager, you can be saved. God has no respecter of persons. Uh, if you're a young adult, you can be saved. God has no respecter of persons. Uh, if you're an older person, you can be saved. Uh, if you're so old, the moss is growing on you. You can be saved uh, because God has no respecter of persons. Uh, uh, somebody's telling 
telling me the other day, they got saved at the age of five. And I said, praise the Lord, you didn't waste it. You didn't throw it away. You didn't give it to the devil. I've heard of other people getting saved at a very young age. Some people wait till they're 60 or 70. It's very rare that you hear people that age getting saved today. But people can be saved if they want to be saved, if they desire to be saved. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what their name are. It doesn't matter what their status in life is. God will save you because Peter said to Cornelius, the Gentile, God is no respecter of persons. Don't ever think that God loves somebody else more than he loves you. And he might, he might consider saving you. No, God loves everybody with a love that, he, that will not let him go from us. God loves us with a love that's deeper than the ocean, higher than the sky, higher than the heavens themselves. Uh, the love of God. Uh, the, the, the writer, songwriter said years ago that if the, uh, if the, uh, if the sea was, uh, was, uh, was filled with ink and he had a, a pen in his hand, he could exhaust the ink in the, in the sea and still not exhaust the love of God. Uh, oh, it's beyond our comprehension. It's beyond our explanation. Uh, it's beyond our feeling. It's beyond our thoughts. Uh, that God would love us. He loves the young. He loves the old. He loves the ugly. He loves the good looking. Amen. He loves the slim and he loves the fat. Yeah. Amen. I am saying on amen and just take me longer to get finished. I'm just saying he loves all of us. Peter said to Cornelius, Cornelius, God is no respecter of person. You don't have to worry now that you're a Gentile. God will save you. Now, he preaches two or three things to him that I want us to look at hurriedly. First of all, I want you to know, as he's in the room preaching to Cornelius and his family and his friends, he talks about the witness of the saints to Jesus. The witness of the saints to Jesus. Look with me, please, in verse number 39. And notice what he said. And we are witnesses. Of all things which he did both to the land of Jew and to Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Notice the witness of the saints. Notice again what he said. And we are witnesses. Now who is the we? Well, first of all, it's Peter. Peter is standing there witnessing for two, uh, two, two, two things. He's witnessing about Jesus. And he's witnessing to Cornelius, his family, and his friends. Here's a group of people who followed the Lord Jesus Christ for three and a half years. Now get this in your mind. He's got a story to tell Cornelius. He's been there for three and a half years. He's watched the master. He's watched all that he has done. And he says to Cornelius, I can tell you that Jesus is who he says he is. Because we have witnessed who Jesus is. The Bible said in verse 38 that they were witnesses of the virtuous life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 38, the Bible says, notice what it says, who went about doing good. Peter is saying, watch it closely. Peter is saying to Cornelius, we watched him for three and a half years. For three and a half years, Jesus went about doing what was good. Now, I don't know all that he said. I kind of think I might know some things. But I just went through some things. In essence, here's what Peter is saying to Cornelius. Cornelius, we witnessed Jesus. We can tell you that Jesus is the Son of God. We can tell you that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. We can tell you that Jesus is not a fake. We can tell you that he's the Son of God. We can tell you that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be. Because we witnessed him. We watched him. We observed him. We walked with him. We ate with him for three and a half years, Cornelius. And I can tell you, what we're telling you about Jesus deserves you to put your faith in him and trust him as your personal Savior. Because Jesus Christ was everything he claimed to be. And Jesus Christ was everything he said he was. Amen. I can just say, Peter, let me give you an illustration. There was a wedding one day in Cana of Galilee. And they ran out of fruit juice. They ran out of the fruit of the vine. They ran out of wine. And he said there was a panic taking place, Cornelius. And he said, all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. His first wedding. All of a sudden, he shows up. 
And he gives them some orders just to keep drawing out, drawing out, and drawing out. And said, uh, Cornelius, you won't believe it. He said they thought they was uh, they thought all of the wine uh, had been uh, had been consumed, but he said when Jesus said you just keep drawing out, there was no end to the amount of wine that came. It just kept multiplying. He said everybody there at the wedding was served. They thought they had a shortage, but when Jesus showed up, the Son of God multiplied the wine. He said, uh, Cornelius, I want you to understand something. I was there. I tasted of it. It was good stuff. Cornelius, I want you to understand, only God can take vessels that seem to be empty and fill them to capacity and keep on, keep on meeting the needs at the wedding. The wedding, they thought was a washout, but it was a victorious triumph of people getting married and the happiness of getting married because Jesus showed up and he provided a miracle of wine for the wedding. Uh, Listen, we're witnesses of that, Cornelius. Only God can do that. Uh, Mr. Cornelius, I want you to understand something. We was in the boat one day and it looked like the boat was going to go down. The waves were lashing against the boat and the wind was blowing and it seemed as if uh, the ship was going to go down. And he said, Cornelius, let me tell you something. I, you, you, won't, you may not believe this, but I want you to understand something. We looked out of that ship as it was doddering around in the water and tossing to and fro and said, we thought someone, someone was walking on the water and we said, surely not. And we looked out there and there was Jesus walking on the water. We witnessed that. Uh, want you to know, uh, Cornelius, want you to know he's God. Cornelius, nobody could do that if he wasn't God. I want you to know that Jesus came walking on the water and uh, he he said, uh, Cornelius, I want you to understand something. I even asked Jesus if I could get out of the boat and walk with him. Uh, and Jesus said, come on. And he said, I stepped out of the boat and I was walking on the water with him. I was walking on the word. I was walking by the power of the Lord Jesus. Cornelius, you won't believe it, I know. But we witnessed it. That boat was about to go down and Jesus showed up and the waves laid down peaceably beside the ship and the wind quit blowing because here's the one who controls the waves of the sea. Cornelius, Cornelius, I want you to understand, only God can do that. He said, we've witnessed that. He said, Cornelius, you won't believe this, but death has no dominion over Jesus. He said, Cornelius, there's a little, uh, Jairus had a little daughter, and the daughter had died, and said, uh, I watched Jesus take that individual that was dead, and I watched Jesus raise Jairus' daughter. He said, you won't believe it. The Lord presented the child back to the parent alive. He said, we was over there in, uh, in, in Lazarus, uh, uh, at Lazarus' tomb, a friend of Mary and Martha, and he said, you won't believe it. He'd been dead for four days, and Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And out of the darkened cavern of that tomb uh, came Lazarus floating up in all of those wrappings uh, and tapestry, tapestry of death. Uh, and he stood in the presence of the Lord alive after four days being dead. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Only God, Cornelius, Amen. only God can raise the dead. Amen. By the way, that's the, ser- that's the same God we serve. Amen. Here's a witness. Here are witnesses. Here are witnesses. I can hear Peter say to Cornelius, one day he was walking down the street and we heard somebody say, unclean, unclean. And he said over there was a bunch of lepers. uh, And he said, my Lord went up there and touched them. Uh, Nobody's supposed to touch them lest they become contaminated. And when my Lord touched the leper, instead of Jesus becoming contaminated, he decontaminated the leper. Uh, He touched the leper and the leper was made whole. Uh, He said, Lazarus, we're witnesses to that. You can rest assured, you and your family and friends sitting here in the room, you can rest assured that this Jesus can do anything you ask him to do. He can save you if you want to be say because he's God incarnate in the flesh he said Cornelius we walked by a cemetery one day and we heard all kinds of moanings and groanings and he said Cornelius there's a man out there running around in the cemetery stark naked and Cornelius we found out that man was demon possessed They had chained him to try to contain him and the power of the demons had broke the chains. 
I'm a, I would imagine that the parents and the mothers and the dads in the area would say to their kids, now when you go out to play, don't go near that cemetery. There's a madman out there. But said, Cornelius, one day Jesus came by and he met this maniac of Gadria. And the Lord Jesus spoke and those demons came out of that man at the authority of Jesus Christ. They went down into a bunch of hogs, ran down in the water and committed hogicide. He said, I want you to understand, even the demons, even the devils of hell are subject to the commands of this person. And if the demons of hell are subject to the commands of this person, Cornelius, I want you to understand, he can save you as a Gentile. He can save your family and he can save your friends. We have witnessed it. We are witnesses as to who Jesus Christ is. Amen. I can hear him say to Cornelius, we went up on a mountain with him and he was transfigured and his inward deity came out and we witnessed it and we heard the voice of God the Father saying, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. He said up there on the mountain, we saw him as who he is, very God of very God. Amen. Oh yeah, I can hear him. I can hear him saying, we're witnesses. We can talk to you about it. We've been there. But he said, I want you to understand something, Cornelius. Here's how you can be saved. We witnessed his vicarious death. Look with me, please, in your Bibles in verse number 39. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and they hanged on a tree. The Bible said here that Jesus went about doing good. He didn't die for his sins because he did good. He was the son of God. But Jesus Christ died for the sins of Cornelius and his relatives and his friends. Listen, and he died for you and he died for me and he died for us. We have to believe that, by the way, if we get saved. And Peter said to Cornelius, I was there. We're witnesses. Now, what was Peter doing? Peter knew what happened, even though, listen to me, even though he was denying Jesus. A little maid came out while he's been tried and said, was you not with him? And he cursed and swore and denied he didn't even know Jesus. But he went away and he wept bitterly. You know why he wept? Because he was saved. You know why Jesus, uh, Judas didn't weep and went out and hung himself? Because he wasn't saved. That's the difference in saved and lost. Uh, and, and, and Peter watched the crucifixion afar off. And the other disciples watched the crucifixion afar off. They stood there while the ground was shaken beneath their feet. They stood there from 12 o'clock noon till 3 o'clock in the afternoon while the, the, the clouds and the sky became as black as sackcloth. Uh, they, they noticed that out of that darkness there was the moaning and the groaning while Christ was becoming sin for those of us in this world. He said, we've witnessed his death. Cornelius, you can be saved. Jesus died for you. But secondly, I love this. We're witnesses of his resurrection. Look at verse number 40. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Oh, praise the Lord. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Yes, he is. Peter said, we witnessed that. Peter went to the tomb. John and Peter went to the tomb and they noticed the stone had been rolled back and they looked down in the tomb and there was the clothes that Jesus had been laying in, but they are still there. They haven't been moved, but Jesus came up out of them and Jesus appeared with his disciples and in the upper room and he appeared with them as he walked on the road to Emmaus. And then when he made his ascension, 500 brethren at once testified, we have seen him. We have watched him. We have heard him. We have fellowshiped with him. Jesus is alive. The greatest message to the church of this hour is that we serve a risen Savior. He's alive. He's not dead. He's alive. He has saved us. He's constantly watching over us and looking after us. And we're going to meet Him face to face. Not a dead Savior. We're going to meet a living Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Cornelius, I want you to understand we, we, we happened to be there when He died. I want you to understand we happened to be there uh, Cornelius uh, at his resurrection there's the witness of the saints but I want to say secondly there's the witness of the scriptures 
Notice, if you will, please, in verse number 43. I love this. To him gave all of the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The New Testament hasn't been written. He said, not only have we witnessed it, there's the witness of the servants, but there's the witness of the Scripture that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The witness of the Scripture. And what he's saying is, Cornelius, all of the way from Genesis to Malachi, those Old Testament prophets have witnessed that Jesus Christ is the coming Messiah to come into this world. The witness of the Scriptures. My friend, whether you're in the Old Testament, are you listening to me? I'm trying to get out of my introduction. <laughs> whether you're in the Old Testament or the New Testament, there's one hero. Amen. Whether you're in the Old Testament or the New Testament, there's one hero. And his name is Jesus. He's the hero of the heroes. His the name is the name that's above every other name. There's some great names in the Old Testament. Moses was a great leader, but Jesus was greater. Joshua was a great leader. He led him into the promised land, but Jesus leads us all the way to glory. The priesthood in the Old Testament, it was okay so far as it went, but we got a high priest today who sits on the right hand of the Father. Uh, let me tell you, he don't have beginning of days. He don't have ending of days. Uh, let me tell you, he's not sick. He's not feeling well. He's not growing old. He's the same as he was when he went back in his glorified body and he's there alive for us. He knows us. He loves us. He cares for us and he wants to minister to us. Oh yes. Praise the Lord. There's the witness of the scriptures. You know what's so interested in the Bible in the Old Testament scriptures? The Old Testament scriptures drills it down. Let me explain what I'm saying. If someone in Tennessee wants to call the Brian Baptist Church in Winston-Salem. The first thing they've got to do after they pick up the phone is they have to dial a three-digit number. It's called an area code. They dial 336. Now, wait a minute. If they have a cell phone, they are holding a little package in their hand that can reach the ends of the world. That's amazing, isn't it? The amazing technology we have today. You can take a little cell phone, hold it in your hand, you can talk to anyone in England, you can talk to people in Africa, you can talk to people in Russia, don't want to talk to anybody there, but you can. We have talked in here in the church, we have talked to our missionary in Ukraine over the telephone, over a little telephone. So you can take that little phone and you can connect to the ends of the earth. But when you have a specific person you want to connect to, you've got to start off first of all and isolate the rest of the world. So the way you isolate the rest of the world and you zero in on a particular locality, you put in what's called an area code. And when you put in 336, you have isolated tens of millions of people. I'm about to have a fit. You say over a telephone right now. When you put in that 336, you isolate the rest of the world. Now you're into a small segment of the world. And then that person in Tennessee wants to reach us. They put in three more numbers, 785. Now, in that 336 area code, they have lessened the population there. Because now they're in a 785 exchange, <coughs> which means... 
They have isolated other people in the 336 area code. We're drilling down and getting to a smaller nucleus of a group all the time. Then that individual in Tennessee dials seven. And there's a lot of phones in 336 that start with a seven. But then they put seven, eight. Now we're beginning to isolate a lot of people. Seven, eight, five. Then O oh, five, and you get to two. And you've isolated a lot of people. But when you put that seven in there, you have isolated the whole world. And you've zeroed in on one place. Berean Baptist Church, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. The Old Testament writers started out with a broad spectrum of the Messiah. And they kept dialing. And they kept dialing. And they started off in the book of Genesis. And they said there's going to be the seed of the woman. That's unusual because you don't trace the seed through the woman. It's a prophecy of the virgin birth. But there in the book of Genesis, it just talks about the seed of a woman. And then in the book of Genesis chapter 12, it talks about Abraham. He's going to be of the seed of Abraham. And then the Bible moves on to Genesis 49. He's going to, he's going to come through the tribe of Judah. And then the Bible keeps moving on. And then in the book of Samuel, he's going to be a descendant of Jesse. And then in the book of Micah, He's going to be born in Bethlehem. And then in Isaiah, he's going to be born of a virgin. They drill it down from a broad perspective of a family, of a nation. They drill it down to an individual. The number that's dialed in the Old Testament is J-E-S-U-S. And when you look in the Old Testament, you see his death. That's what he said to all them gave the prophets witnesses. He said, I want you to know this wasn't an accident, Jesus dying. Because back in Genesis 22, God told Abraham to take his son Isaac up on the mount. And that Mount Moriah was the same place that Mount Calvary is today. He took his son up there. He said, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. That sacrifice would be the Lord Jesus Christ. Up there on Mount Moriah, he's talking about the sacrifice in the book of Leviticus. It's the house of blood where they bring all of these different kinds of animals and all of them are pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the book of Exodus, there's the tabernacle. And he's saying all the Old Testament prophets prophesied about this coming Messiah, Cornelius. There in the tabernacle, it was made out of wood and gold. The wood represents the, the humanity of the Lord. The gold represents the deity of the Lord. The brazen altar represents the sacrifice of Calvary. And the lampstand represents Jesus, the light of the world. And the table of shoe bread represents Jesus, the bread of the world. And the altar of incense illustrates Jesus accepted the prayers of the saints as they go up. And the holy of holies represents the very presence of God. Everything in the Old Testament was pointing forward to to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even the ark. Do you know that the word pitch that God told Noah to use to pitch the ark on the inside and the outside is the same word we get the word atonement from? Amen. You know what God told Noah to do? Atone the ark. Put the pitch on the inside and on the outside. Why? So that when the water comes, it won't come in. It's atoned. It's kept perfectly and it's kept safely. That's a type of what this Messiah is going to do. Uh, we get on the ark and the water is the judgment of God on this world. But when this world's judged, we're floating right along in the ark of safety uh, because we've been atoned for by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they just preach about it all over the Old Testament. They're drilling it down and they get the phone number right down to Jesus all the way through it. Yeah, he said, I want you to understand something. 
that the prophets witnessed and testified Cornelius about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I could go on and on with that. Cornelius, let me tell you about Jesus because we have witnessed it. Let me tell you something about Jesus because there are prophetic witnesses in the Scripture. But lastly, Cornelius, let me tell you something. To him gave all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believe on him shall receive remission of sins. Now, listen, don't you get this? This will help you. Peter's preaching. And you know what happens? Somebody butts in on his preaching. Just about the time Peter said to Cornelius, you can have remission of sins. We've witnessed that he's the son of God. The Old Testament prophets witnessed that he's the son of God. And while, pre while Peter is saying, you can receive remission of sin, all of a sudden, while Peter yet spake, the words of the Holy Ghost fell on all of them that heard the word and gave proof that they have put their faith, their belief in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit of God comes to indwell you. And while he's preaching now to this Gentile, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit broke in and said, you don't have to preach no more. I'm going to take over from here. And the Holy Ghost showed up. And that bunch of Jews in the next verse, the circumcision, looked so perplexed they couldn't understand how God would save a Gentile. Notice while Peter yet spake, the Holy Ghost came on them and in Verse number 45, and, the, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on them also had poured, he poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, you know what happened? We had a second Pentecost. The first Pentecost went to the Jew in Acts chapter 2, but now the Pentecost is coming to the Gentiles uh, and they believe the message that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Uh, and now and in their belief, God has sent the Holy Spirit to indwell them, to prove to them to show to them that they're born again. Why? Because those of us who are saved right now, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And that's one reason we know we're saved uh, because His Spirit bears witness with our spirit. And as many as are led by the Holy Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You say, preacher, how do you know you're saved? There's something down on the inside uh, knocking up and down in the gable end of my soul, uh, going from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head uh, that's saying, son, you're saved. Uh, you belong to me. Uh, it's, it's under the blood. You're, it's forgiven given. You're, you're in the house, the ark of safety. And when you trust Christ as your Savior, He forgives you. He justifies you. But He sends the Holy Spirit of God inside of you to bear witness that you are saved by the grace of God. Well, Cornelius got in while he was preaching. He had to stop preaching and give way to the Holy Spirit. I long for the day when it happens at Berean Baptist Church. I get halfway through and all of a sudden, Brother Cup gets blessed, Sister Saucer gets to run over, and the next thing you know, people are just praising the Lord because they're glad their sins are forgiven. They're glad they're saved. They're glad they're on the way to heaven. And this world is not our home. We're pilgrims and strangers passing through. We're going to soon be gone here, and we're going to soon be in there. We're going to be out of here. We're going to be at home there. And we get so happy thinking about our position, thinking about the forgiveness of our sin, thinking about the goodness of God. We kind of just let the Holy Spirit go ahead and just cut in uh, and enjoy, help us enjoy being saved. I didn't get a dose of persimmon pudding, bless God, when I got saved. I got sweet honey from the altar of heaven and I'm still enjoying being saved. Now if you're happy being miserable, God bless your unwor unworthy soul. I want you to know I'm glad to be saved. Cornelius, I want you to know we witnessed he's the Messiah. Cornelius, I want you to know the Old Testament prophets drilled down to one person. There's only one person that can, that can fit that scenario in the Old Testament. He's the Messiah you've been looking for. He showed up. He died. He's gone back to heaven. He's presently accessible to save you. And old Cornelius and his family, evidently they're calling out and saying, Lord, forgive us. Lord, save us. Notice what he said in the 14th chapter, and I'm finished. I'm not finished. I'm quitting. Uh, the 13th chapter. I want you to notice this. My glasses keep crawling up under the pulpit. Uh, notice uh, the 11th chapter. Paul, uh, Peter's going back to Jerusalem. He's telling them up at Jerusalem what happened at the Gentile house Cornelius. And look at verse 14. 
Simon's been sent down to his house. Notice what he said. Who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house, look at that, shall be saved. He went down there to that group of people sitting somewhere in a big room with his family and friends and said, we've witnessed he's Jesus. The Old Testament prophets has witnessed he's Jesus. And whosoever will call upon his name will have forgiveness and remission of sins. And the Holy Ghost showed up and got down in their soul and they started saying, well, hallelujah, praise the Lord. We've got it. We've got it. We're saved. Hallelujah. We're saved. Thank God it's good to be saved. I recommend it. Ran in, I ran into a man the other day who was retired. I said, how do you like it? He said, I recommend it. I recommend getting saved. Cornelius was shut out. But God came along and changed the perimeters and shut him in. In grace. Because a man preached to him. Notice what he preached to him. I read it to you a while ago. He preached the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's the message of salvation. Quit trying, start trusting. Amen. Get it out of the flesh, get it in the hands of the Spirit. Trust Jesus. This guy sitting around, I use him quite often. I call him Mr. Bubbly. He hadn't got over being saved. He told me something over at the end of the Sunday school class this morning, it brought it to my memory. He got saved back in my office a while back. And when he started leaving my office, he said, I just lost my job because of COVID. Would you pray that I can get a job? I said, yeah, we prayed. Asked God to give me a job. I guess 45, 50 minutes later, he called me back. He said, you're not going to believe this. He said, when I walked in my house, my phone was ringing. And he said, a restaurant here, and he's in the restaurant business. He said, a restaurant called me and wanted to know if I wanted to go to work for him. He said, this getting saved really works, don't it? You know what he said to me a while ago? He said, I got my largest check this week. Is that what you said? Yeah. And you know what that means? <laughs> you know what that means? It works. Yeah, tithe. That's right. I'm, I'm just here to, yeah, amen. I'm just here to tell you. I'm here to tell you, it's a lot better when you're on the inside enjoying it than it is if you're on the outside looking in. There's a lot of people that are on the outside. The Bible in Hebrews 6 says they've tasted of the good word, but they've never digested. There's a lot of people who know about Jesus but they don't know Jesus personally. You say, what's the difference? Heaven and hell. You need to know him. Cornelius got saved. He heard the gospel. That's the means by which we're saved. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed for just a moment. God always has a reason for the message in a very special way. I know that I have delivered what God put on my heart to deliver today. And should you be here today without Christ, if what I said seemed to be foreign to you, maybe you ought to come today, talk to the Lord around the altar. If you're saved today, but you've allowed this world and the things of this world to rob you of your spiritual vigor. You ought to slip out and get around this altar today. He paid the supreme price for you and me and us. And if you need to come, I want you to come. Father, I want to thank you for these who are responding and others that probably need to help us to do so in Jesus' name. Bless us. Help us to do what needs to be done. Touch us, anoint us, and use us. In Jesus' name. Sing the stands of invitation. If others need to come, would you come?